I now look to Sir David King to close the case for the proposition. Mr. President, uh, honorable speakers, I, I'm going to start by telling you that I'm in a very difficult position. I've got as many close friends on both sides <laughs> of the bench here, and we are all agreed, apparently, that climate change is a massive problem and needs to be challenged. So that places, I think, all of us in quite a difficult position to discuss something that might look a bit like semantics. So let, let me just, however, say that I think there's a real issue here. And I'm going to raise a point that hasn't yet been discussed, which is I, I'm going to propose to you that people tend to respond to individual events rather than to scientific analyses and statistics about a collection of events. And I'm also going to suggest that this is a trend that is very disturbing at the moment. And I pick up on Trump. I'm going to mention, if I may, Brexit, that these are two trends that indicate a very disturbing feature around the world. And it is the questioning of science and statistics that I think underlies that trend. So, for example, when we have extreme weather events, hurricanes in the Caribbean, when we had a very hot summer in 2003 in Central Europe, and by the way, the number of excess fatalities then was 70,000, the biggest natural disaster in Central Europe. When we have these events, people are very disturbed by them. The newspapers pick them up on their front pages. But when the scientists provide their analyses and say, actually, these hurricanes might not have been as intense if the oceans hadn't have warmed up due to climate change, that long, hot summer of 2003 in Central Europe has been analyzed. And the scientists conclude that without climate change, even in 2003, there would have been far fewer fatalities. But this. These factors are omitted from the reports, omitted from our consciousness. And so it's the individual response that I'm really concerned about. Science and, st and statistics has a strong tendency, actually, even to elicit the opposite reaction to the one you might anticipate. So for example, and I'm afraid I am going to mention Brexit a bit longer, Take UK immigrants into this country. And when the economists analyze their impact on our economy and conclude that overall, the immigrants are positive effect on, on the economy, a recent Gallup poll published just a few days ago shows it has the opposite effect. The people who are told this information become more in favor of keeping immigrants out of the country than they were beforehand. So we're in this extremely difficult fix where those of us who understand the science, those of us who understand statistics, are being disempowered by this effect that is taking place amongst individuals in our country. Now, does that have any effect on the way governments respond? So let me just deal with that. The British government does believe, with this house, that climate change is a major challenge to our future civilization. We have all party agreement. The reason why I am almost unique in having worked with four prime ministers, Blair, Brown, and then I was invited back to work with Cameron and May. Why is that? When I was invited back into the Cameron government, I was told, your appointment underlines all party agreements. So you could say, right, this is terrific. And I was put into government, and in government discovered that a number of things that had been set in place under the Blair and Brown governments, and I was very actively responsible for that, 165 climate attaches 
in our embassies around the world. No other government has any. And I'm going to say to you that agreement in Paris is attributable to the actions of the British government more than any other. And we can argue about that, but we certainly put a big effort in. Then in came David Cameron, and after discussions, David Cameron agreed that the setting up of the Green Climate Fund in Seoul was really too sluggish. It was taking place too slowly. It was just a few billion dollars when we were talking about a hundred billion dollars a year being needed. Today it stood at 10.2 billion dollars until President Trump removed two billion. So it's now at 8.2 billion dollars, of which the British government put in one billion dollars. But we decided we were too impatient with that. The British government under David Cameron decided to set up the International Climate Fund. And he added a further sum of money in the run-up to the Paris Agreement to that fund. We've spent more than half of it. And I bet you there's hardly a member of this audience who knows how much money was in the British International Climate Fund for spending in the developing countries of the world. Well, the answer is, I've just said, $8.2 billion <coughs> contributed by all countries together. Our International Climate Fund, nine billion pounds, 12, 13 billion dollars. That's the British effort. And so when I was appointed as the diplomat responsible for traveling around the world to discuss this issue with other governments, I was in a very strong position had all these climate attaches and very deep pockets. No surprise, finance ministers very keen to meet me. And a lot of developing countries that were really difficult on the issue of climate change coming into line. So this was a very powerful position alongside the agreement in 2008 in Parliament that we would reduce our emissions by 80% by 2050, and we've set that in train. So all of that put us in a very strong negotiating position. But the problem is that since 2010, although I was appointed and told by the chairman of the committee, because you're going to be great because you're going to be able to talk on television and radio, you are a TV personality, I was never allowed once onto television and radio for the whole period I was in the government with Cameron and May. Now you've got to ask why was that, and I think that is very relevant to the debate we're having today. Because the reason, I can tell you, because I eventually went into number 10 uh, to talk to the comms people there, why every request from the television and radio got turned down. The reason is, we are concerned <coughs> that if we put this into the public domain, everything that we're doing, and boast about it, we'll get a public reaction against it. There's the public apathy that this side of the house is really concerned about. That if we actually even admit to these wonderful things the British government is doing, we'll get an apathetic response, and by that I mean, of course, the Daily Mail and the Sun. Yep. I think, I think that I'm not going to defend what the government decided. That's not my intention. I'm not suggesting that it was right. I think I, I believe that the government ought to have provided the leadership on this issue in the public domain. And part of that leadership could have been applied by letting me go out there and explain what we were doing. But wherever I talk now that I've left government, about this issue, people are amazed. They don't know that Britain was doing as much as it did in the run-up to the Paris Agreement. So the point I'm, I'm making here is all of this work has been going on in the British government and the public are kept out of it because there's a fear of public apathy. Now, I, I'm, I'm now going to suggest this wasn't only in this country, and I'm not referring to Trump's appointment, election. I am going to refer to my very good friend, Al Gore. 
His election in the year two, when he was running for the presidency in the year 2000, do you know how many times he mentioned climate change in his election campaign? Zero, absolutely zero. My good friend Al Gore, the man of the inconvenient truth, deferred from referring to climate change because his people said to him, you will not be elected as president if you actually raise the issue. So I just leave you with this single comment. We as individuals all set examples for each other in our behavior. We're not independent of each other. We work within a society, we set examples. And I would beg you to move through the eyes door to indicate that we as individuals have a real responsibility. Yeah. Thank you.